ich, dass ich auf der Bühne sehen. Und uh, so, yes, I will switch now to English. <laughs> Just because I uh, will not do so well in German and other people uh, speaking in English. Okay. <clears throat> so first, thank you for uh, coming to my talk. I know there's lots of other things to see and do here at Java Land, and I'm very excited to start us off. Um, this talk, how I plan to spend the 45 minutes that you've given me here, is to start out by um, talking about programming language platform growth. And uh, I'm going to start by talking about my personal experience with programming language platforms. This is a good time for me to say that everything that I'm going to be saying, most of the people in the audience probably know at some level or another, so there's not going to be new release information here, except for one very important announcement with a special guest uh, in the middle of the talk. Um, but the content of the talk is more about bringing the things together that I've experienced over my career, and uh, hopefully um, this collection of things might elicit some other insights uh, that you might take away from it. After the uh, little experience portion, we'll go into the heart of the talk where I talk about table stakes and deal makes, and then we'll just finish with a summary and uh, key takeaways. So a little bit about me. Uh, in addition to my regular development job, uh, I've written uh, these books that you see here, and uh, I've also had a lot of opportunity to teach and give workshops at conferences like this. Um, my training partner, Oliver Shemansky, and I are giving a talk on Thursday uh, about uh, introduction to Docker and Kubernetes. And this process of writing the code, writing the books, teaching about it, has given me a perspective uh, after doing it for long enough, uh, about platforms that I would like to share with you. Um, in particular, the Rockstar Programmer book. Uh, I have a few copies here, and if you want to check it out, you can see me in the exhibition area tomorrow, um, where I interviewed lots of uh, people who have built successful platforms, and I've got a chance to ask them what it was about the platforms that they built that made them successful. So in addition to seeing them and working with them, I've also had the chance to know and speak to the people who have had success there. So, um, and then I've had a little hand on my own platform that, uh, that I've been very fortunate to be involved with, and that's uh, Java Server Faces and also Servlet. And these are two parts of the Java EE and now Jakarta EE uh, specifications and platform uh, that I hope people are still uh, interested in and using. So I want to start by sharing some experiences from uh, earlier in my career, and uh, I really didn't fully appreciate it at the time, but these experiences gave me a unique first-hand perspective of the birth of some important platforms that you're all using every day. And uh, these are just my opinions, so please come to see me in the exhibitor area if you disagree or want to talk some more about it. So <clears throat> one of the things that was a Rockstar programmer secret was the aspect of luck, right? Luck plays an important part in everything. So you have to be prepared, but you also have to have some luck. And in my case, um, it started with my choice of university. I chose to go to University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and I happened to be there at the time when all of this important stuff was happening. So uh, that is uh, NCSA Mosaic which was the world's first graphical web browser, and I had a chance to work on that as a student programmer. And this is really the first platform that I saw being born and watched grow up. And so some of the lessons that I learned from that, uh, why did it take off and catch fire? Well, um, at the time, in the early 1990s, uh, the notion of having a distributed information system where people could be on a network and fetch content seamlessly and easily from other computers and display it locally was still a very novel idea. And the distributed information systems at the time were largely uh, text-based. You know, you had Gopher, and in fact, the first, versions, the first version of the web before Mosaic was just text-based. So um, it's been a continual process of building on the shoulders of what came before. So of course, in the case of the web, um, he was able to build, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, that is, was able to build on top of um, the existing TCP protocols and come up with this very simple um, way of exchanging information. And basically, he took S SGML, standardized generalized markup language, made a subset of it, which was easier, and, and added this concept of hyperlinks. 
So he took what was coming before and added a thing, which was the easily able to do hyperlinks, right? Then um, the insight that uh, Mark Andreessen and several other people at U of I had was to add the image tag to the HTML. So what was prior a text-based thing became a visual thing. And that key ingredient of taking something from text to visual was the thing that sort of really made it uh, actualized for people. So <clears throat> one of the first key skills, uh, platform ingredients that I saw here was what I call copy paste ability. So I myself did this, and any, anyone else who had a home page in the early days of the web uh, did the notion where you could just view source, copy the stuff, put it on your own server, and then you've got your own home page. So the ability to take content, tweak it, and repurpose it uh, is a key ingredient in platform success. Um, another key ingredient that we'll see again and again is the ability to deliver a solution that was something that everyone wanted. There was a, a need for it. Uh, maybe it wasn't clearly articulated in everyone's mind, but once it was there, it was like, ah, oh, yes, I needed this thing all along. And um, finally, it was better than the competition at the time. So once the web happened, these other platforms, such as Gopher and Waze, um, sort of fell by the wayside, and everyone could see, OK, this is where it's going to go. So copy pasteability is super important. At the same time this was happening at U of I, also um, they had the NCSA HTTPD, which was um, not the only web server around at the time. It was maybe one of two or three. There was the CERN one also. Um, but the NCSA HTTPD um, was able to cobble things together in a unique way. Another key platform success is the ability to take advantage of what exists and sort of bring it together to provide novel solutions. So one of the first e-commerce apps on the web, maybe the first, I would probably go to say as the first, was this uh, thing that we built uh, at U of I. So the UIUC net had this um, email to fax service where you could send an email address, I'm sorry, send an email to the special email address provided by the university and it would send a fax if you put the right headers on, there was some syntax for putting that there. And so the idea was, let's build this thing that enables you to uh, have um, a web site that will connect to and send an email via this fax service. And then we could hook it up to um, this sub shop called Jimmy John's, which is a very popular uh, submarine sandwich shop that actually also started out at U of I. So the web, I'm sorry, University of Illinois has given us uh, Mosaic, the NCSA HTBD with CGI bin, <clears throat> and also Jimmy John's subs. So that's one of many in innovations that the University of uh, Illinois has uh, brought. Um, so what this thing did, it was really simple, right? CGI bin uh, cobbles together things in, a, in an exciting way. It was also very simple. The CGI bin protocol was just really as basic as it could get. Um, and that was an important factor. So the key, another key takeaway here is simplicity. Um, while I was working on Servlet 4.0, this was the thing that brought HTTP2 to Java. Now HTTP2 is so much more complex than HTTP1. It has a lot more features to make it performant and all of those great things. And if you want to talk about that, there's other presentations or you can talk to me too. But the takeaway there is you have to start simple. If the first version of HTTP had all of that other kind of stuff, header compression and binary framing and um, you know, the ability to do content streaming, uh, there's no way it would have taken off. The notion that the first HTTP was just basically mail headers, carriage return line feed, carriage return line feed, and a bunch of text, um, that was really important. Because that means you could write a web server with some basic knowledge of Unix sockets and uh, existing stuff that you had. So, the simplicity of that, plus the simplicity of writing your web pages, help things take off. I keep harping on this because it's really important. Um, building a ramp like we have here to, for new developers to come into the platform. So after graduating, I had a chance to work at uh, Silicon Graphics. And um, basically, when I graduated college in 1995, anyone who had anything to do with the web, could even experience writing web pages, was able to it was a boom time. It was very easy to get a job. And getting out to Silicon Valley was the dream that myself and a lot of my colleagues did. 
Um, and I worked there on this uh, web authoring tool. Now, does anyone here remember VRML, Virtual Reality Modeling Language? That's oh, a surprising number of hands. Okay. Is anyone still writing VRML? <laughs> no. So this was the first <clears throat> example of a platform that I saw that concerted effort was behind trying to make it popular. And uh, a lot of investment. They did all the right things. They had industry partners. They had um, open standards. They had authoring tools. Uh, but for one, for, for several reasons, it didn't take off. Uh, I think the main reason it didn't take off was it wasn't at the right time. So you have to be right place, right time, right skills. That applies to people and jobs, but that also applies to uh, technologies and platforms. So another aspect as to why this one didn't take off, I believe it was always from the beginning too proprietary. There was a ulterior motive behind all of it, which was all of the corporate players that were backing it were doing so to drive their own sales in some way. Now, a lot of technology companies do that. Um, and that's been the play for many, 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 many years. I think it's less true now than it's ever been in this really massively polyglot world that we have. Uh, and that's the topic of this talk, you know, focusing on five different languages. But um, I think the world has noticed that this play of trying to build uh, a carrot and use a stick behind uh, is not really something that um, takes off. So in spite of the concerted effort of very powerful vendors, it didn't uh, take off. The next platform I had to work with uh, was basically user interfaces. And the first one I did, you know, I didn't do it myself, I had experience with, was uh, AWT on the upper right there, and then we had, I'm sorry, upper left, and then we had Swing, and uh, then I actually ended up working on Java server faces. Now, the dispute, the uh, success of JSF um, can be disputed in terms of its number of deployments, but one thing it definitely did do right was create a community of components from a variety of different vendors that could work together and uh, be assembled in one coherent application. Uh, and this is something that um, none of the previous efforts at building Java UI platforms really uh, succeeded at. So the key takeaway there is um, the ability to have everyone have a stake and have an ability to build success. And I'll talk about this later when I get to the notion of monetizing your platform. Monetization is not just about making money, but it's also about being able to build a livelihood and build a company that grows with that platform. Finally, on the web stuff, um, there was this web framework war that was happening at the time. This was during the era. There were lots of wars going on. Um, but the web framework war in the Java space, you had you know, Struts and Wicket and Webwork and Tapestry, and uh, there was X, X work, so many different ones. Uh, and I have observed that if you can somehow get a war to happen around your platform, it's actually a good thing because it convinces people, oh, if people are this passionate about it, uh, then it must be worth learning about. Maybe not the specific instance of the thing that's in the war, the specific belligerent, um, but the whole space. <clears throat> and this brings me to uh, the other platform I've known, which is uh, J2EE. And this one uh, addressed lots of shared pain points, uh, building enterprise Java applications. And uh, then you had uh, Rod Johnson come along, and he wrote his first book there, J2EE Design and Development. And the demos from this book actually became the kernel of the Spring framework. So here is another war that has sort of grown up the notion of Java EE versus Spring. And uh, again, this, this struggle here has drawn people's attention to the importance of enterprise Java. So while each individual player uh, is fighting it out in a competitive sense, the community is the winner because they're getting uh, the best of um, all the ideas out there. So the importance of community and the importance of having sort of friendly competition where everyone wins and the end developer wins. So um, with all of these platforms, the common thread is they were, again, in the right place at the right time with the right skills. And missing any one of these probably would have negatively impacted the success outcome. So what makes a programming language platform successful? There is uh, a very hot platform that's coming out right now. Uh, you know, it's been out for a few years now. It's called Kubernetes. 
And I had a chance to talk to one of the two authors of that, or founders of that, Brendan Burns, no relation to me, although my brother's name happens to be Brendan Burns, which is really kind of strange. <laughs> um, so I talked to him about what made Kubernetes successful. And uh, to summarize this, and this is, I go into great depth in this on my talk, on my class on Thursday, but someone put a tweet out there, which is, Kubernetes is basically web sphere for millennials. And I thought that was brilliant because that's, that's what I'm saying. It, and it really, it is. And that's, that's, I've thought about this a lot. So let's see what uh, Brendan had to say about why did Kubernetes explode in popularity? I hope the audio is going to work. And I think okay. it's because I think it's because we've seen uh, the cloud take off in significant ways, um, and yet I don't think that the tools for managing and deploying applications kept pace with the um, the flexibility and power that cloud was offering. Um, mm -hmm. And so people were sort of overextended um, with some of the more traditional DevOps tools, um, and so containers. Uh, and then Kubernetes really exploded in popularity because they fit, uh, they, they address some pain points that, that people had. And I think one of the other reasons is that they fit pain points that everyone had, mm -hmm. from IT administrators to developers to CTOs. They, they, they just hit all of these different pain points. Um, and so it was one of those rare moments where I think everyone was aligned in, in, and got a win out of, out of it, right? Um, and so I think when that happens, you see rapid adoption. I okay. think it's because. All right, so again, right place, right times, right skills. That's what made this take off. So um, I didn't put this on there, but I had the chance to work on some early nascent microservices uh, things that we were doing at Oracle. Uh, now we've got Project Teladon, which has kind of came out of that work. <clears throat> and I do encourage you to take a look at uh, Project Teladon um, as a microservices-based framework. Um, but when we were first starting with microservices at Oracle, we were actually building it on top of uh, Mesosphere, so Mesos and Marathon uh, as a uh, orchestration engine. And uh, at the time, it wasn't quite sure if Kubernetes was going to be the winner or something else like Mesos Marathon. But now we see a few years down the road that Kubernetes has become the uh, de facto orchestration thing. So, you know. It pays to understand which one is going to win, because <clears throat> you have to look at what's, what, where the momentum is and then put your bet there. So that's, speaking of bets, I like to characterize this whole talk in terms of table stakes and deal makes. So in poker, uh, table stakes is the minimum amount of required to play a hand of poker. This is what you need to have to sit at the table. Deal makes is the factor that seals the deal. Uh, when you're looking at programming languages and you're going to choose one for your project, um, these are the features that really will make you say, I'm going to choose this one over that one. <clears throat> so the table stakes. How well does the platform fit your particular kind of problems? Um, how well does it work for you when you actually try to use it for real, these production concerns? In English, we have a saying which is, this is where the rubber hits the road. And I really like this saying because the build life cycle, facilitating reuse and distribution and tooling, these are things that um, aren't really about the core language itself, but they're absolutely essential for working with the language and doing things in production. And then, of course, how good is the tooling is an important uh, uh, table stake there. The importance of fit cannot be overstated. Uh, the team aspect of fit is actually more important than the technical aspect. So, the platform that you choose should be the platform that lets the developers on your team be the best they can be. And what I mean there is, if you have a team that is really experienced in one platform and they're productive with it, <clears throat> you have to consider very carefully how you're going to switch or migrate to a different one. So this being Java land, I think everyone is experienced with Java, but there's lots of other things out there and maybe it's important to take a look at them and see where you can go with them. <clears throat> the next side is the deal breakers. So, um, and makers. So we got monetization, how the people that are participating in the platform can achieve benefit of some kind. Uh, the killer app, which is the thing that makes that particular platform um, really fit well. Stack overflowability, this is a, a super important attribute. 
And uh, then these other considerations, which I had to move into the other section in the interest of time, but they're still really important. So maintainability, talent pool, breadth and depth of library support, and uh, the compatibility history that the language steward is doing. So these are my categories, but I always like to bring this clip in from James Gosling uh, from the Rockstar book regarding the um, problem with categories. So let's see what James says there. This is goofy Nietzsche quote that shows up in Wayne's world, <laughs> something like, you know, if you label me, you, you nullify me or something. <laughs> and I need to labeling things. Okay. Um, if only because it, it, it you know, the, the labels become the thing that, that, that define the universe. Yeah. And for me, the really interesting stuff is the stuff that doesn't fit. <laughs> okay, so those are the labels. There's the warning about the labels. Let's get into it here. First one, uh, core language features. What, ca what kind of language are you really? How well do you play with other languages? And um, how verbose are you considered to be in general? So um, are you object-oriented? Are you functional? Are you procedural? Are you imperative? Um, how well do you handle encapsulation? How well do you do uh, security? All these other things. Uh, and I will get into that. But first, I'd like to introduce um, my friend and colleague from Oracle, uh, Dalibor Topic. Now, we had the pleasure at Oracle of introducing Java 8, world premiere of Java 8, at Java Land in 2014. So we are continuing the tradition here. And today, we announced the general availability of JDK 12. And Dalibor is going to talk about that. So Java Land and Java. Thank you so much, Ed. Wow, this is awesome. There's so much of you, so many of you guys. Awesome. Um, well, thank you. Thank you, Ed, and thank you. Uh, actually, thank you all the contributors to made Java 11 work so well for us. Because OpenJDK that I work on at Oracle is, um, in many ways, like Java Land, a huge community effort where, um, while Oracle does a lot of work, we have a huge number of contributors across the industry, both companies as well as many individuals who are contributing to make Java better and are helping us improve the technology both by contributing bug fixes and changes, but also by testing releases, giving us feedback and so on. So thank you very much for doing that. Thank you for making JDK 11 work really well. And thank you for continuing to do that as well for 12. Because as I'll post later tonight on this uh, PM blog URL, the picture for 12 looks pretty much the same. We've actually increased the, the percentage of community contributions coming into 12 from our organizations, and that's great. It means uh, OpenJDK is a wonderful, a vibrant community to be a part of. For us at Oracle, though, it's also important uh, to you know, sell stuff. And so uh, we've used the opportunity of having a new release cadence to introduce a new support offering. And the great thing for you is if you're shy or for any other reason, don't want to talk to salespeople, don't worry, we got you covered. You can just order support online if you want to continue to use the Oracle JDK, you know, you, you like and love, I guess, right? Um, but of course, um, staying on a long-term support release is something for risk-averse people. We're developers, we like new stuff. And the great thing about new release cadence is it means we can ship stuff more quickly. And it's so good to be part of a team that ships software regularly on time, right? There used to be a time a couple of years ago when shipping stuff on time wasn't quite a thing, but now it is. And so today is the day, or for us in Germany, tonight is the night. So, you know, sometime after dinner tonight, you'll be able to download the latest JDK 12 release. And uh, other than coming out on time, of course, it has features. It has features uh, that go across the board. It has performance improvements, so your code will just run faster, start up faster, hopefully, and uh, be better at garbage collection if you try it out. But it'll also uh, bring in a new experimental garbage collection um, implementation. It'll have uh, a new a API for the bytecode fans among you to play with. And most importantly for most of us, it's the first release that delivers a preview feature for the language, uh, switch expressions, which make it much easier for you to write code that uses switch statements without falling through and all the kind of fancy surprises I'll there. I'll talk about that because Swift has that, and it's one of the things that's really awesome when you work with Swift. Right, so this makes your code simpler, and you can turn it on easily with 12. And you can get 12 tonight. Um, for Oracle JDK, you go to java.oracle.com, and for uh, Open JDK, for the open source release from us, you go to jdkjava.net. And of course, you know, if 12 is old news for you by tonight because it's out there, don't worry, we got you covered. 
If you go to JDKJava.net, you can even get JDK 13 early access builds, so you can be ahead of the pack for the next Java land. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks, Elmar. Oh, and he didn't mention we have several other talks. Please take a look at these. Take a photo snap if you want about this um, to learn more. We have uh, Oleg Shaljev, a good friend of mine who was at ZT and now is uh, at Oracle. We're very, very happy to have him on the team. Um, Heather is giving a talk today at uh, 6 o'clock. So take a look at that. Is Heather in the audience here? I don't know if she is. I hope she is. If you're watching out there, hello. And uh, here we go, value types. And value types is another thing that Swift has. So uh, a key pra uh, platform success ingredient is the ability of the platform to assimilate the best parts of other languages. Um, and having a facility to do that and a, and a willingness to do that is an important thing. So back to core language features. Um, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly because we only have about 15 minutes left. And uh, I'm just going to give you the high points. Uh, the slides for this will be available on the conference site, too. Um, and I don't want to just hit you over the head with all the different data levels, but the important thing here, um, the language style. This is less important now than it has been in the past uh, because the need for OO purity seems to be less than in the past. Um, I'm kind of a mixed feelings about this because I grew up when OO was the way you solve problems. OO, A, and D was what you learned in university, and we applied that to all of our um, problems that we were facing. But object orientation is not as, uh, you know, it's kind of optional seen now. So some of the languages are not OO at all, like uh, the Node and Go and Python, or some of them have it, uh, it's as an optional feature. So you can do OO with Python, but most of the Python that I've seen is not OO based. Uh, Swift, on the other hand, is uh, fully OO based, but you don't have to do it that way. Um, but somehow it feels more natural to shift to OO in Swift than it does to switch to OO in Python. Uh, type system. This is another one. This used to be a huge debate, but more languages, modern languages, have stepped this issue aside by having a very sophisticated type inference rules. So um, Python has always had type, uh, has been dynamically typed, but there is a way to do static type checking in Python as a process in your build pipeline. So it's kind of a cheesy thing, in my opinion. However, in uh, Swift, I really like the way they did it because they have a really good uh, type inference. Uh, they have a, a very strong type system that's actually there, but it's natural fit. And uh, they also have generics, whereas Go has all of that but does not have a generic type system. The concept of optionality, does that exist in the language or not? Um, as far as learning the language, uh, when you're a new developer coming to an existing code base, I find that uh, encapsulation is really important. By encapsulation, this is the basic information hiding that OO has been bringing to us for many years. And somehow, when you're working on a, a language that has good information hiding, having in your heart the knowledge that, OK, I only can see and pay attention to the things that are actually in scope at the current time is really important for maintenance. Whereas in languages that don't have that, if you have an old code base, there may be bug fixes where someone just totally reaches around and abuses the information in hiding because there's no runtime check on it. And uh, there's really no way to know if the code is doing what you think it's doing until you actually run it. So um, that can be a problem. So I'm a, favor, I'm, I'm a fan of information hiding. Security has two dimensions. How secure can you make your code versus how well does the steward respond to vulnerabilities? So um, both of those are important to consider. OK, the next table stake, production concerns. Um, so what I mean by production concern, that's, again, where the rubber hits the road. It's not in the core language, but it's absolutely essential. And uh, an important factor here is what is the steward doing? By steward, I mean it's a word in English that means one who takes care of things. So all of these languages have someone that plays the role of steward. In the case of Java, it's very explicit. It's Oracle. Uh, but in the case of Python, it's the Python Software Foundation, which is a more nebulous kind of thing. Uh, in the case of Swift, it's absolutely Apple. No one questions that. Um, so all of these languages have a, a concept. And once you have a concept of a steward, you can pay attention to what the steward is doing for all of these different kinds of things. So build lifecycle, reuse facilitation and distribution, and testing. 
So the build life cycle, how the code gets built and put into production. Um, I'd like to differenti differentiate this in terms of whether the steward is taking care of that concern or not. Um, the two newest platform choices to the list here, uh, Go and Swift, do keep this in-house. While the older ones, Java, Python, and Node.js, the core language, the core stewards, have delegated the build lifecycle to other technologies. Now, when you delegate it to other technologies, then you have the possibility for the market to take effect there. So in the Java system, you know, we had, um, where's my thing here? Oh, it's much a small pointer. Pen. There we are. So Maven is the clear winner, but Gradle is also popular. Uh, whereas in Python, you know, there's not one clear winner. And uh, from the Node side, um, there is, again, lots of different vendors, uh, but NPM is an important part of it there. I'll see that on the next slide. Um, another aspect is how well the build lifecycle plays with the cloud. Um, if it's a cloud native language, like Go, pretty much, uh, it will go work very well with CI CD. Um, I also want to call this out. Um, is the solution, uh, the build lifecycle portion of the solution monetized? And uh, in the case of um, Maven and Gradleware, both of those are for-profit companies, Sonotype and Gradleware. And uh, just be aware of that. If you're betting on a solution that is coming from a, a third-party company that has to exist and has to turn a profit to keep around, um, that can change um, their decisions on how you're um, depending on the thing. Um, okay. So reuse and distribution. Um, this is how you allow others to reuse your code. Um, and there's two levels to this in my perspective. Um, the language level module system, so how you as a developer when you're writing the code declare the existence of a module and um, declare what it needs, its dependencies, and what it exports. So all of this is the core JDK9 module system in Java, for example. Uh, but there's also the notion of the binary artifact repository. So the languages have that except for, um, well, there is one for Swift, but uh, Go, source code is king. So there is no like central repo of uh, importable artifacts like there is in Java. There's no Maven central for Go. It's basically just GitHub or any other Git system. Um, are there multiple competing concerns for reuse and distribution? Uh, well, again, for Java, Maven central is the key winner. Uh, Python. No, it's just the, the PyPy, um, which you install with pip. Um, uh, on the Go side, they have this thing called dep. It's not a part of core Go, but it's labeled as the official experiment. It's the way you do dependencies in Go. And of course, npm.js is the important thing for uh, Node. And uh, Swift uh, has the Swift package manager. Uh, let's see here. With multiple competing concerns, then you have the notion of choice fatigue. So again, I, it's a trade-off. If you get a solution f that comes from the vendor, then you don't have any other choice. It makes it a little easier. But when there are multiple choices to make, that gives you more flexibility. <clears throat> Let's talk about how easy it is. Uh, in the Java side, you know, even though we've been doing modules for 22 years now, it's still evolving. Um, in the Python system, it's seen as kind of good enough. Again, for Go, its source code is king. Also the same for Swift. <clears throat> but when we get to JS, you know, the node module system comes to the picture, NPM JS. And I saw this really nice tweet yesterday. And uh, let me know if anyone else has experienced this. Uh, when you build a node app, uh, you have this node modules folder. So the uh, package.json pulls in like everything you possibly need. And it's just as bad as Maven in terms of downloading stuff when you build the node package. Uh, but it's in some sense, kind of worse because it can become a real hairy mess. So, you know, I deleted my old modules folder and got 50 gigabytes back on my disk. So, uh, has anyone else had that experience? It's kind of a, a pain. Uh, the last one on the reuse and distribution is, uh, is the, does the distributed artifact include uh, a learning capacity to it? And none of them do it except for Java. And I mean their Java with Maven Central, when you deploy something there, you have the ability to put Javadoc in the artifact as well. And I, I like that they make that uh, a part of the picture. Um, but in the GitHub world, it seems like the notion of writing hardcore API docs and making everything 
packaged nicely together is not as popular now. There, people are saying getting away with just writing a readme.md, which is kind of not up to date or um, not fully in, in, in sync with the uh, actual code. So uh, that can be a problem. So make sure you pay attention to that. Um, so next up is uh, testing. Uh, the red thread there is that you should absolutely judge a platform by the quality and depth of its testing story. Uh, again, the importance of is the steward the one that's delivering the testing story or not? Uh, and that ties in with uh, this notion of testing being in the uh, language DNA or not. So in the case of Java, it wasn't really um, a part of Java, but the platform has always been responsive to coming stuff in from the outside. So I remember when they added annotations to Java SE 5, I think it was, and uh, that has had a lot of benefits from CDI and dependency injection to uh, testing. So the ability to put annotations on your code has been a able to uh, do cross-cutting concerns with uh, testing, and that's been an important aspect. Uh, let's see, so Swift and uh, Go do have sufficient support for TDD uh, in their language, um, and I think that having TDD, uh, again, it's debated whether you need to do that or not, but I, I personally think it's a very important thing, so I think it's an important thing for the language to have that. Finally, uh, the tooling. Uh, does the tooling for the platform have the things we come to love as Java developers? Code completion and IntelliSense, automated refactoring, how good is the source level debugging, how well are frameworks integrated? So uh, I think code completion is important if you really need to crank out a lot of code uh, in a short amount of time uh, because that you know, enables you to go fast. Um, refactoring is important if you're going to be evolving a design. Um, and also it's important with the understandability of the code, and I think that's uh, one of the deal makers. Lastly, um, debugging here. Personally, I think this is super important, but many of the younger developers that I've encountered seem to feel like putting print lens all over the place is good enough. Um, I don't know if that's, uh, I agree with that, but uh, for me, I really like having the source level debugging. <clears throat> and uh, you can see there that all of them have it at some level, uh, and they do it differently too. Uh, the way Go does it is particularly interesting because it has a separate tool called Delve, which is part of the uh, Go tool chain that lets you um, hook up the developer to the thing. So I guess it's kind of like JPDA uh, uh, in Java, but for Go. Into the deal makers and breakers to finish off. Um, okay, monetization. Uh, how, easy it to reap, how easy is it to reap rewards from the language? So this could be monetary rewards, getting paid. Uh, this could be reputation. Uh, this could be the ability to create future opportunities for yourself in terms of consulting gigs. Uh, and the choice of language is important there because they div have different characteristics for this domain. <clears throat> um, and this has a different meaning for individual com contributors, uh, whether you're an employee uh, or a freelancer. Well, if you're an employee, you want to be able to stay current and uh, you know, have your skill set match those of your employer. Or if you need to change jobs, be able to have uh, the skills that are portable and in demand. However, if you're a freelancer, uh, it's more about like what the particular cl uh, client base that you have is and what they need. Okay. So for Java there, uh, it's monetization. It's really seen as a safe bet. There's uh, lots of jobs. And um, if you're writing the code to actually charge money for it, the most basic and pure sense of monetization, write the code, people pay for the code, then they can use the code. Um, in the Java world, that tends to be nothing but expensive licensed enterprise software. So as an individual, uh, you don't see people writing you know, small bits of Java code and charging for it, for example. Uh, Python, the monetization story there, it's, it's hot in many of the growth areas. So machine learning, data science, and DevOps, um, those are great with Python. And if you're wanting to do that kind of thing, learning Python can make you very, a very hot property. Uh, Go, relatively fewer jobs. Uh, the lack of a closed source module system is challenging in some corporate environments. Everything has to be accessible in source code, for example. <clears throat> Swift, I'm sorry, JS has um, the largest number of jobs of any of the ones that I'm covering here. Um, and it also has the lowest barrier to entry. 
Uh, SWIFT is very high demand due to a smaller number of practitioners. Um, so, so as a result, if you can get a SWIFT job, it's very well paid because there aren't that many developers out there that do it. But it's the only one where you can get paid selling licenses to your particular software, and that's mainly just with uh, apps. Next up, the killer app. So Mosaic was seen as the killer app for uh, the web. And so each of these languages has its own sort of sweet spot for what the killer app is. Uh, they can be organic, that's something that just kind of grows up and happens um, as a result of the platform itself, or they can be uh, intentional, where the company is saying, okay, this is the thing I'm going to target. So the killer app is important to the success of a platform because it allows the development of the language to proceed. In other words, it's kind of the cash cow, the thing that keeps the lights on, and we can evolve the language as long as people are still using it for that thing. Stack overflow ability. So this metric is the most important metric I've seen in my career. Um, I go so far as to say that uh, those of us that are old enough to learn a language before Stack Overflow have a fundamentally different experience of learning. Uh, because now knowing that almost anything you face in your day-to-day -day job, you're going to be able to Google it on Stack Overflow or search it on Stack Overflow and see, kind of get in the ballpark there. And that didn't exist before Stack Overflow. So uh, the Stack Overflow, uh, Overflow ability metric is, you know, the quality of the messages you get when you put in something in the language. Uh, let's take a look at the Stack Overflow trends. Uh, this is the percentage of Stack Overflow questions that month over time. So the percentage of all questions on all of Stack Overflow. And you can see uh, Java being the winner there, but Python has had a huge spike when machine learning sort of took off. And you can see when Swift started, when they, that graph goes up there. Uh, and then this one, you can look at the uh, number of answers. <clears throat> so. For the next few graphs, I'm going to go through these super quick, but look at the shape of the curb, look at the magnitude of the y-axis. More Stack Overflow points means there's more help being dispensed. So uh, Java, 140k uh, points for the leader, Python, 120k, and you can see they all have a kind of similar curve. The first five answer the bulk of the uh, questions, then it kind of flattens out. Go only has 12,000 points for the leader, uh, JS has 60,000 points for the leader, and Swift uh, only has 25,000 points. So um, another funny thing about Stack Overflow is uh, the seasonality of the questions. And a lot of this has to do with school terms. So when school starts, you'll see the number of questions uh, spiking on Stack Overflow because people are trying to get their answers. Um, but again, this one is super important, and it's uh, impossible to intentionally create. This one has to be organic. And that's why it's such a good metric to look at for the success. Um, other considerations, uh, compatibility, talent pool, library support, and maintainability. Um, I want to talk about compatibility because you can look at compatibility as um, having uh, either an abusive partner or a, a good loving partner that takes care of you. So um, if you have an abusive partner, they're always breaking deals and they're not keeping promises. And, but if you have a nice loving partner, they're generally uh, up to date and they're keeping up with their promises. So uh, just look at the platform and see how well they have kept up with the backwards compatibility story. Um, okay, so here's the summary. Uh, these are all general purpose languages. Uh, there's obviously no one perfect fit. Uh, it's important to question conventional uh, wisdom regarding language choice. Uh, these again are the killer apps list. And uh, the key takeaways. So um, the team, how comfortable is the team with the platform? How easy is it for them to onboard new developers? How easy is it to build a solution that is easy to allow onboarding, right? I mean, if you have a, a language that encourages writing documentation, encourages doing testing, uh, it's possible to uh, onboard people much easier than if language doesn't force you to do that. Okay, so I'll leave this up, and uh, the slides will be available on the conference site, and I'll also put out a tweet with my uh, uh, bit.ly link to the PDF of the slides, which I will upload down. Thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of Java Land. <laughs>